This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the very first in our series of Gombrich lectures on the classical tradition um, to be given tonight by Professor Jonathan Bates. Um, it's, um, it's a great pleasure to, to have so many of you here. Um, and it's a, a wonderful thing, I think, to have something, uh, not just the piano, but <laughs> something more uh, tangible and intellectual uh, to celebrate um, Professor Gombrich here in this building wh where he worked for so many years. He was director of the Institute uh, between 1957 and 1976, and he's had a room here uh, for a long time after that. Um, it was here, I guess, that he worked on Art and Illusion, on the sense of order. Um, I think he really finished the story of art before this building um, was, was produced. But I suppose I think of him particularly as an extraordinary stylist of the English language and a master of the essay, especially the long essay, the essay with an enormous range, um, like those essays in, in symbolic images and in, and in norm and form. And I, I don't think it would be any exaggeration to say that Professor Gombrich was probably um, the most important humanistic scholar working in, in Britain uh, in the second half of the 20th century. He, he had an extraordinary reach and, and, and an extraordinary range. And I'm very happy that we can celebrate uh, his intellect and his achievement um, in, the, in these lectures. Um, but really I should concentrate on introducing Professor Jonathan Bate, um, Provost of Worcester College, Oxford, um, and Professor of English in um, the University of Oxford. Um, he um, started his career um, working on the classical tradition, his remarkable book on Shakespeare and Ovid, and his uh, wonderful edition of Titus Andronicus. Um, one of Jonathan's very first articles, um, one on the amazing caricatures as a source for thinking about um, late uh, 18th century, early 19th century um, ways of viewing um, Shakespeare, was published in the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institute. So we've long thought of him as a friend um, of, 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 of the house. Um, he's um, un unbelievably um, productive. He's, he's made an edition um, of the complete works of Shakespeare. He's about to publish an edition of the Shakespeare Apocrypha. Um, soon after that, he'll finish um, a biography of, 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 of Ted Hughes, of himself, of course, someone for whom the classical tradition is absolutely central. So I'm very much looking forward to this series of lectures. Just before I introduce him, I should thank Princeton University Press for their um, uh, contribution and indeed their stimulus to establish this series of lectures. So Jonathan is going to speak on tragical, comical, historical pastoral, Shakespeare and classical. Well, thank you, Peter, for that very generous introduction, which has slightly preempted my own introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of having my undergraduate dissertation at Cambridge, supervised by Frank Kermode. Um, and when I told him that I wanted to go on and do a doctorate on Shakespeare and Ovid, he said, you must go to the Warburg Institute. Um, but before I was able to take his very good advice, um, I got a scholarship to do a year's graduate work at Harvard, where I got swept into a a debate between my namesake, Walter Jackson Bate, and his Yale pupil stroke rival, Harold Bloom, about the burden of the past and the English poet, or as Bloom would have it, the anxiety of influence. As a result of that, I found myself writing a PhD to work out what I thought about poetic influence via the Romantic poets uh, as influenced by Shakespeare. And it was a while before I got onto the Ovid project, by which time it was too late to be a graduate student here at the Warburg. But as Peter intimated, I, I had the great honor of, I think my first article in a major journal uh, was uh, a piece coming out of that thesis, looking at um, the way in which Shakespearean allusion worked in caricature. And Gombrich himself uh, read that, and I knew his very fine 1956 Mellon lecture called The Experiment of Caricature. And I think something tickled his fancy um, about the bringing together of Shakespeare and caricature. And that was a big first step um, on in, in, in my own career. 
The extraordinary thing about Gombrich's work um, was its range, its catholicity, um, an extraordinary variety of subjects that he could approach with absolute aplomb, constantly discovering new connections, finding a certain unity in the tradition, but always reading with the grain of the artwork, not against it, and writing to communicate pleasure and wonder in the art of reading, whether reading a painting or a text. A criticism of playful sympathy, not of ideologically motivated cynicism as we encounter and re-describe the creative act. And for me, those are model humanistic values as a writer, as a critic. And of course, Gombrich always was willing to speak to a general as well as a scholarly audience, which has been very important to me in my work, whether the story of art or his extraordinary only posthumously published in English, Little History of the World. He has managed to bring the, the life of the tradition uh, uh, to many, many people far beyond the walls of the Ivory Tower. Princeton University Press is one of the few university presses these days that also seeks to reach a wider as well as a professional audience. So I'm particularly delighted that they will eventually be publishing an expanded version of these lectures, incorporating a couple of other lectures on aspects of Shakespeare in the classical tradition that I've delivered in recent years but not published. Um, I'm assuming there may be a similarly slightly mixed audience today. There will be some very distinguished scholars among you. And for you, uh, much of what I say will be familiar, but I hope some things will be new. But perhaps there will be others uh, who are not familiar with the Warburg School of Criticism. Um, so I just wanted to begin with, with a few words um, about that. A.B. Warburg, uh, 1866 to 1929, famously was the eldest son in the Warburg banking dynasty. The story goes that he gave up his right to inherit the bank to his younger brother in return for a deal whereby the bank would give him enough money to buy books for the rest of his life. And he devoted his life to scholarship. Eventually, in the 1930s, this brought him and his great institute to London in refugee, as refugees from, from Nazi Germany. And of course, Gombrich came as a research assistant and then became director. Warburg was fascinated by classical patterns, how artists keep the energy of antiquity alive through alluding to the classics. He was also fascinated by the relationship between poetry and painting. Famously, Warburg's doctoral thesis focused on the two great Botticelli paintings, The Birth of Venus and Primavera, exploring them in relation to their classical sources. Anthony Grafton, a great Princeton scholar, um, has written wonderfully of Warburg. Uh, and I'm just going to quote a little from, from what, he, what he, he, he writes. This, this is um, some time ago, uh, referring back to Warburg's 1893 doctoral dissertation on those two Botticelli paintings. Grafton writes, exactly 100 years ago, so 120 years ago now, A.B. Warburg took a short walk on what proved to be a long pier. In his doctoral dissertation on Sandro Botticelli's Birth of Venus and Spring, he used fewer than 50 packed pages to analyse the two paintings. Two points in particular worried Warburg, one stylistic and one substantive. Why had Botticelli, a painter whose natural bent lay in the portrayal of still, dreamy figures, here used fluttering hair and clothing to give a sense of violent motion and emotion? And why had Botticelli de decided to depict original combinations of myths drawn from classical sources, like the Homeric hymns and Ovid's Metamorphoses, on so grand a scale? One set of facts yielded answers to both questions. Angelo Poliziano, the tutor of Lorenzo de' Medici's son Pietro, described mythical scenes strikingly like those that Botticelli painted in the, in the stanze which he wrote to celebrate a joust sponsored by the Medici and won by Lorenzo's younger brother Giuliano in 1475. An elegant, elegantly eclectic poet in both Latin and Italian, Poliziano drew his images of goddesses and nymphs from the Greek and Latin poetic texts he later taught in the Florentine studio or university. 
like Botticelli, he combined his borrowings in new ways, and he described figures in motions and the fluttering clothes and flying hair that expressed it more obsessively and vividly than Ovid himself. Botticelli, whose deviations from the ancient sources matched Poliziano's, must have shared the poet's sensibility and relied on his advice in his mythological paintings. The details of Primavera came not only from Poliziano's Italian stanze, but also from a range of Latin poetry, above all Lucretius's De Rerum Naturae. Poliziano must have combed these works for the painter, as he did when he adapted them in his own poetry. So in other words, for Warburg, in both the poetry and the painting, a kind of Dionysian ancient world is brought alive in Renaissance Florence. This is a very different class classicism from the, the austere formalism of Winkelmann. So for Warburg, there is a sense that the bringing together of the past and the present is the key to our understanding of tradition. Ovid, in Warburg's account, is a key influence on this process. There's a, there's a footnote uh, where Warburg in his thesis is describing this phenomenon of Venus's moving hair. A footnote to uh, a wonderful image in the Amores of Ovid, which would translate as something like this. Her lovely hair is ruined, hair that Apollo would covet, hair that Bacchus would want for his own head. I might compare her tresses to those the painter once showed nude Dione supporting with a dripping wet hand. A sense of movement, a focus on the body, a kind of lightness an interest in the relationship between poetry and painting. These are matters to which I will return at the end of his lecture. So Venus's hair works for Warburg as an image of how art works across time, how the particular speaks to the general, the artwork of the past to the future. There is a sense for Warburg and all his followers that the classical tradition is something that it is essential to keep alive if civilization is to be kept alive. Shortly after the Second World War, the great scholar E.R. Curtius published his book, European Literature and the Latin Middle Ages, in memory of A.B. Warburg. And he spoke there as follows. When the German catastrophe came, I decided to serve the idea of humanism by studying the Latin literature of the Middle Ages. These studies occupied me for 15 years. In other words, for Curtius to study ancient works of culture was a way of responding to the barbarism of the present. Now, we do not live in the world that Warburg and Curtius lived through, but we do nevertheless live in a world in which the classical tradition is under threat, is diminishing, not due to, as it were, the censorship of people who think that erotic books are unsound in the way that the Nazis did, but endangered, in danger of burial beneath the avalanche of the information revolution. As everybody knows, more information is now available to anybody in the world with an internet connection at the push of a mouse than was ever available to the whole of history before our time. How can the classical tradition survive the welter of the information age? It's fascinating for me, going back to Curtius's book and looking at the main topics that he discusses there uh, in, in his account of the culture, the literary culture of the Middle Ages, the centrality of an education in Latin, the importance of rhetoric, the topics of or oratory, the great themes of the goddess Natura, the significance of the art of metaphor, the figure of the hero, the ideal landscape of pastoral. Because, of course, these are all themes that are utterly central to Shakespeare. The revival of classical antiquity that was so important to the English Renaissance was also a form of continuity with the Latin Middle Ages. 
The arts of rhetoric, the use of language to persuade and move an audience, were at the centre of Shakespeare's education and those of his audience. Quintilian, in the famous tenth book of his Institutio Oratorio, his great handbook on the art of rhetoric, um, spoke of the importance of having a copious supply of words and matter, the importance of the orator constantly practicing their writing, their reading, their speaking. And Quintilian speaks too of the importance of animation in delivery. And here I'm seeing a continuity with Warburg's notion of the animation created in the figure of Venus through the hair. The speaker stimulates us by the animation of his delivery and kindles the imagination, not by presenting us with an elaborate picture, but by bringing us into actual touch with the things themselves. Then all is life and movement, and we receive the newborn offspring of his imagination with enthusiastic approval. We are moved not merely by the actual issue of the trial, but by all that the orator himself has at stake. Well, Quintilian and other theorists of rhetoric also had a lot to say about genre. One of the points Curtius makes in passing in his, in his great book is that there are two ways of thinking about literary history. We can think about it in terms of authors or in terms of genres. Hamlet, we could think of as an example of a Shakespeare play, or we could think of it as an example of a Renaissance tragedy. There are different ways of organising literary history. The great literary historian G.K. Hunter wrote the history of the drama of Shakespeare's time through the genres. And I think genre is especially valuable um, as a way of approaching drama, just as it is for art history. There's a wonderful passage um, in the great opening essay on the aims and limits of iconology in Gombrich's Symbolic Images, where he talks about a, a Renaissance garden, uh, a garden uh, described by Giovanni Rucellai, a garden where one could see ships, galleys, temples, columns and pillars, giants, men and women, heraldic, heraldic beasts, monkeys, dragons, centaurs, camels, diamonds, little spirits, cups, horses, donkeys, stags, birds, bears, dolphins, jousting knights, archers, harpies, philosophers, the Pope, cardinals, Cicero and more such things. And what Gombrich says is that if you didn't know this was a garden, you would have no understanding of this strange juxtaposition of such diverse things as monkeys, the Pope and Cicero. But because it is a garden, you can have that eclecticism. I would suggest that the genre of a Renaissance garden and the genre of a Shakespeare play have a broad similarity in this respect. That is to say, a Shakespeare play is like a Renaissance garden, a place of recreation, a place of surprising juxtapositions, of eclecticism in its range of reference. The theatres of Elizabethan London, as you see here, were on the margins of the city. The Puritan-minded city fathers didn't want them on the north bank of the Thames. They were out on the south bank, on the, the edge of town, and close to the gardens in this um, image, a, 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 a famous uh, image from the long view of London. In the foreground, there is a formally laid out garden, and then just behind it um, is the, 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 Glo the Globe Theatre. The Globe is, uh, this is the famous uh, mislabeling. Uh, the Globe is labelled bear baiting, and the hope the bear baiting arena is, is, is labelled the Globe to remind us that a Shakespeare play and a bear baiting are similar forms of public entertainment. But I'm intrigued by this garden in the foreground, um, the sense that uh, the, these are places where you go, as I say, to leave the city and to go into thoughtfulness and recreation. So the play itself, a kind of genre. Well, what did Shakespeare and his contemporaries know about genre in a more strictly literary sense? One of the standard sources uh, for the, the literary theory of the period is George Putnam's Art of English Poetry, where he writes about the origins of poetry, as he saw it in classical antiquity, and spoke of how the ancient Greeks divided poets into the heroic, the lyric, the elegiac, and the epigrammatic. <coughs> 
He also said that there were poets who wrote only for the stage to recreate, recreate the people with matters of disport in shows and pageants. And those writers for the stage were either comic, of which the most notable examples among the Greeks were Menander and Aristophanes, among the Latins were Terence and Plautus, or they were tragical, such were Euripides and Sophocles with the Greeks, Seneca among the Latin. Then he also says that there was a kind of middle way between the high seriousness of heroic poetry and the frivolity of drama. Uh, and in that middle way, we discover the art of eclogue, uh, the writing in the voice of shepherds, the voice that we now call pastoral, and the art of satire and invective, rough and bitter speech. And we find as we, we look through the writing of Shakespeare's time that there is considerable familiarity with these terms. Shakespeare was almost certainly well acquainted with John Florio, the Anglo-Italian writer, translator and dictionary maker. In Florio's Italian dictionary, The World of Words, he defines the Italian satira as a satire, a kind of poem rebuking evils and abuses, an invective. Or again in the table al alphabetical of Robert Cordray, a kind of elementary dictionary of the early 17th century, there's a definition of an epigram as a sentence written upon any for praise or dispraise. Elegy is an interesting one among these terms because the term elegy and its adjective elegiac have two interrelated but slightly different senses. We would tend to think, if, I, if, if one speaks of an elegy now, we immediately think of a poem of mourning, a poetry in memory of the dead. And that, that meaning did exist in the time. Um, but there was another sense of elegy, which is um, a love poem, but usually a poem of unrequited or unfulfilled love. And so the idea would be uh, that the lover is melancholy because he has not, it is usually a he, he has not achieved his beloved, and that melancholy then would sort of shade over into the melancholy of poetry on death. There's a further complexity in that um, elegi elegiacs were also a, a, a meter, a, for, a, a metrical form uh, in, in Latin poetry, uh, a form particularly used for love poetry. Ovid's Amores, when translated by Christopher Marlowe, was called all Ovid's elegies. Shakespeare has a good sense of this dual resonance of the word elegy. I mentioned earlier Quintilian saying a writer constantly needs to practice. It seems to me many of Shakespeare's early works are practice works, works where he's testing his art, indeed showing off his art. The Two Gentlemen of Verona, which may be his earliest surviving play, is a very good example of that. Here's a passage where the very changeable character, unreliable character, Proteus, uh, has been, is um, involved in the desire of the Duke to get a girl called Sylvia to fall out of love with her lover Valentine and to fall in love with a chap called Torio, who the Duke thinks would be a suitable husband for him. And Proteus is going to be the sort of, the kind of the agent to do him for it. It's a bit of a sort of Serrano de Bergerac kind of scenario, because of course what happens is that Proteus really wants to seduce Sylvia for himself, even though Valentine's his best friend, and thus the two gentlemen fall out over a woman. It often happens in Shakespeare. Um, so this is, this is what um, Proteus suggests to, to Torio. Say that upon the altar of her beauty you sacrifice your tears, your sighs, your heart. Write till your ink be dry, and with your tears moist it again, and frame some feeling line that may discover such integrity. For Orpheus' lute was strung with poet's sinews, whose golden touch could soften steel and stones, make tigers tame, and huge leviathans forsake unsounded deeps to dance on sands. Wonderful image of dancing on sand there. We'll see that image again late, later in the talk. <laughs> 
After your dire lamenting elegies, elegies clearly meaning love poems, but with the suggestion of melancholy and hence death, visit by night your lady's chamber window with some sweet concert. To their instruments tune a deploring dump. The night's dead silence will well become such sweet complaining grievance. This or else nothing will inherit her. So an elegy, a poem of lover's grievance, but can also become a poet, a poem of grief. We see a further development of that elegiac voice in Shakespeare in the more mature comedy, As You Like It, in the rather wonderful description of a man who haunts the forest but abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. Shakespeare, too, is aware of those other genres mentioned by the classical sources and by Quintilian. Here's Benedict. I'll tell thee what, prince. A college of wit crackers cannot flout me out of my humour. Dost thou think I care for a satire or an epigram? No, if a man will be beaten with brains or shall wear nothing handsome about him. As for satire, Shakespeare was also capable of writing it in the form of drama. I'll be talking in a uh, subsequent week a little bit about Troilus and Cressida, which is eminently well read as a satire upon the heroic poetry of the Trojan Wars. Uh, but equally, uh, I will be talking about Timon of Athens. Timon, the wealthy man, surrounded by flatterers who, when he loses all his money, suddenly finds he has no friends. He's approached, uh, as he's gone into exile, self-imposed exile in the woods, by a poet and a painter. Poets and painters are always on the lookout for patronage. Uh, the poet thinks, what, what, what shall I do? What kind of poetry should, should, I, should I write for time and now? I'm thinking what I shall say I have provided for him. It must be a personating of himself, a satire against the softness of prosperity with a discovery of the infinite flatteries that follow youth and opulency. I find that... Uh, 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 image a personating of himself a satire it is like timon is a living walking satire he, a personation of satire there's a sense in which the poet's image there actually helps us to to place the play generically we also see uh, Shakespeare thinking about genre in the choice of entertainments presented to Theseus and Hippolyta for their wedding festivities in A Midsummer Night's Dream. They're offered the riot of the tipsy Bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. There's Orpheus again, uh, this time being torn apart. Uh, that is an old device, uh, device, a kind of genre suggesting a sort of tableau or they're offered the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning late deceased in beggary that is some satire keen and critical not sorting with a nuptial ceremony so of course what they offer uh, what they accept uh, instead is a tedious brief scene of young pyramus and his love thisbe very tragical mirth merry and tragical tedious and brief well, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow how shall we find the concord of this discord well there are some brief references to elegy satire epigram the poetic genres within shakespeare what about those dramatic genres tragedies of course well shakespeare knows what a tragedy is like this is from a poem but it's a great description of a of what tragedy is like it's from the rape of lucrece oh comfort killing night image of hell dim register and notary of shame black stage for tragedies and murders fell vast sin concealing chaos nurse of blame blind muffled bored dark harbor for defame grim cave of death whispering conspirator with close-tongued treason and the ravisher it's a kind of uh, program note for what tragedy is like and black stage for suggestion of the stage hung with black for tragedy remember uh, the black stage hangings of Marlowe's Tamburlaine or indeed the first line of Henry the sixth part one by Shakespeare and collaborators hung be the heavens with black yes of course Shakespeare knows all about genre the tragedians of the city those visitors to the court at Elsinore. Ah, Polonius reminds us, the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, 
historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical histor historical pastoral, scene individual or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy nor Plautus too light. For the law of written liberty, these are the only men. I've still not fully worked out what scene individual is. Uh, the only other occurrence of the word individual I can find in any text of the 16th or early 17th century is in Dolman's translation of La Primo Dei of 1601, where atoms are described as little individual bodies. Um, so the idea, a play that somehow is so unified it can't be chopped up into different generic forms. Perhaps in some senses, all Shakespeare's plays are scenes individual. So Shakespeare and his contemporaries have a, a sense of the meaning of tragedy and of comedy that is shaped by the classics. The classical dramatist most frequently studied at school and university in Elizabethan England was the Roman comic writer Terence. Most editions of Terence's comedies included not only a prose account of his life, but also an essay ascribed to the 4th century commentator Aelius Donatus concerning tragedy and comedy. And there we find a rigid division of genres. Comedies are concerned with private citizens and low-life characters. Tragedies with monarchs, rulers and heroes. Comedies end in reversals for the better, recognition of children, happy marriages. Tragedies in reversal for the worse, a mighty fall, a mournful death. As Thomas Haywood put it in part three of his Apology for Actors, comedies begin in trouble and end in peace. Tragedies begin in calm and end in tempests. If we look at the dictionaries of the time, we find similarly sharp distinctions. In Cockerham's 1623 dictionary, a tragedy is simply defined as a history or play of death. A comedy, according uh, to Stephen Gosson, who was a, a former dramatist turned Puritan abuser of the stage, a comedy consists of love, cousinage, flattery, bawdry, sly conveyance of whoredom, and the persons of it are cooks, knaves, bawds, parasites, courtesans, lecherous old men, and amorous young men. So very much a sense, low life, everyday characters belonging in comedy, um, elevated characters in tragedy. Shakespeare's acting company, when they became the King's Men in 1603, were licensed freely to exercise the art of playing comedies, tragedies, histories, interludes, morals, pastorals, stage plays, and such other like. I think that that license suggests that from the point of view of performance, there was actually a pretty relaxed view in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. I was trying to ask myself, when somebody went to the theatre in Shakespeare's time, when they went over the river to the globe after 1599, were they expecting to see a tragedy or a comedy? Um, what, 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 was there a sense that those strict generic divisions that we read about actually had any purchase on the stage? Now, that's a difficult question to answer because, unfortunately, we don't have any posters or theatre programmes uh, for, from the period. Um, we have the entries of the titles of plays in the Stationers' Register, and we have printed plays. But I want to suggest this afternoon that the approach to genre in printed dramas may well have been rather different have, and had much more of a focus upon it than was the case with performed dramas. The only full-scale listings we have of plays as performed in Shakespeare's England um, are in the diaries and account books of Philip Henslow, the manager of Shakespeare's rival company. And what's very, very striking, if you look down all Henslow's lists where he, 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 he lists the box office takings and the money paid to the dramatist and so on, he hardly ever says tragedy or comedy. He doesn't really seem interested in, interested in that. Um, the play that in print was called The Spanish Tragedy that absolutely set the model for tragedy 
Um, he always just calls by its name Geronimo. And then there the, the, the seems to be another play called The Comedy of Geronimo. And the only reason he calls that The Comedy of Geronimo is to make it, uh, to, make it to distinguish it from the, the better known Geronimo play. There's a few little examples where the word comedy or tragedy um, appears in Henslow, but very much the exception rather than the rule. The, the only comedies typically are the Venetian comedy, the Grecian comedy, the French comedy. I think I can see a theme there. Uh, it's the comedy of a particular place. There's a, there's a tragedy, the world's tragedy, but all the famous plays like Geronimo, Tamburlaine, Jew of Malta, Dr. Faustus, are not described as comedies or tragedies. Now, when Shakespeare's complete works come into print after his death, they are, of course, called comedies, histories, and tragedies. And we still live with that division of the first folio into comedies, histories, and tragedies. But if you start looking at the use of tragedy as a descriptor on title pages prior to 1623, when the folio was published, there's a real kind of paucity of examples. The key example would be the collected tragedies of the Roman dramatist Seneca. Seneca cannot be too heavy. Published in the 1580s as Seneca, his ten tragedies. But when it comes to the plays written for the Elizabethan stage, there are very, very few tragedies published prior to uh, the, the late 1590s. Very few plays presenting themselves as tragedies. Marlowe's Tamburlaine the Great, the great two-part drama, probably written in 1587, 88, published in 1590. The title page describes it as Tamburlaine the Great, who from a Scythian shepherd by his rare and wonderful conquests became a most puissant and mighty monarch and for his tyranny and terror in war was termed the scourge of God. Divided into two tragical discourses as they were sundry times showed upon stages in the city of London by the right honourable the Lord Admiral his servants. So two tragical discourses, Tamburlaine. Now, the interesting thing about that published text of Tamburlaine is that the, it includes a preface to the gentleman readers from the printer, which says that various frivolous gestures and digressings, which pleased greatly on the stage, have been removed from the printed text. So this is ob obviously what happened is that there were comic interludes in Tamburlaine as staged, but in publishing as tragical discourses, they're taken out in order to give the printed text something of the dignity of, a, a, of, of the classics. Something interestingly different happens with the other foundational text um, of Elizabethan tragedy, Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy. The Spanish tragedy containing the lamentable end of Don Horatio and Belimperia with the pitiful death of old Hieronimo was first published in 1592 in a text that does not contain any comic interludes, does not contain any prose passages. But interestingly, in 1602, a new version was published, the Spanish tragedy, etc., etc., newly corrected, amended and enlarged with new additions of the painter's part and others as it hath of late been divers time acted. In the addition of what used to be called the Shakespeare Apocrypha, uh, but that we are calling Shakespeare's collaborative plays that I and my fellow editors are going to be publishing at the end of the month, we are arguing that Shakespeare wrote the additions to the Spanish tragedy. It will be the first Shakespeare edition ever, I think, to include the Spanish tragedy in the 1602 text. But what is interesting is that this famous scene, magnificent scene, and we're not the first to say this, Samuel Taylor Coleridge thought Shakespeare wrote it. Uh, there was confusion for a long time about a payment to Ben Jonson, but there's very good evidence, and Russ McDonald may disagree with me about this, but there's pretty good evidence that, it's, it's, uh, that the Ben Jonson payment does not refer to the additions as they survive in the 1602 text. But the interesting thing is that the, the scene with Hieronimo and the painter, which is very, is very moving, and it's about the debate between poetry and painting, but it's also very funny 
It's an injection of an element of what we might call dark tragic comedy into a play that before Shakespeare got his hands on it was pure tragedy. Consider three of the very few uh, plays actually calling themselves tragedies in print in the early 1590s. The lamentable and true tragedy of Master Arden of Faversham in Kent. We're also arguing Shakespeare had a hand in this one, probably only one scene. The tragedy of Dido, Queen of Carthage, written by Christopher Marlowe and Thomas Nash. And the true tragedy of Richard III, uh, showing the death of Edward IV with the smothering of the two young princes in the tower uh, and lam the lamentable end of Shaw's wife. That's not Shakespeare's Richard III, it's the old Queen's Men Richard III play, uh, although one suspects it's come into print in 1594, quite a long time after it was first played, because Shakespeare's Richard III has just come out and is making Richard III a hot subject. Now what is interesting here is we've got a, a Tragedy based on a real life story. It's a murder story about a, a woman called Alice Arden who has an affair with a lower class man uh, and they, they hire these villains called Black Will and Shakebag to murder her husband, Thomas Arden. So a very, very domestic, very English tragedy. A classical tragedy, and you don't get much more classical than Dido, Queen of Carthage. And a history play an English history play represented as a tragedy. And in a sense, that's the, that's the kind of menu of available tragic forms in the early 1590s. So, so two of those are published in 1594, um, when Shakespeare also comes into print as the author of a self-proclaimed tragedy, the most lamentable Roman tragedy of Titus Andronicus very much uh, the play that made Shakespeare's name as a tragic author. But again, coming back to my theme of the question of tragedy and comedy, what's really interesting about, very distinctive about Titus Andronicus, is the moments of comedy within the tragedy. In particular, a scene where a clown comes on. How now, good fellow, wouldst thou speak with us? Yea, forsooth, and your mistress ship be imperial. Empress I am, says T Tamora, the queen of the Goths, who's now the empress of Rome. But yonder sits the emperor. Clown Tish, gods, and Saint Stephen give you God, and I've brought you a letter and a couple of pigeons here. He reads the letter, and the Roman emperor says, go, take him away, and hang him present, presently. Clown, how much money must I have? Come, sirrah, you must be hanged. Hanged by your lady, then I have brought up a neck to a fair end. Um, it is, I think, as far as I can see, the earliest example of someone called a clown appearing in a tragedy. The mingling of kings and clowns, something that a classically educated writer like uh, Sir Philip Sidney thoroughly disapproved of. Here, Shakespeare mingles king and clown, as he will famously go on to do in Hamlet. And there's also a sense here of a, a foreshadowing of the role of the clown with his basket of figs in Antony and Cleopatra. Interestingly, the following year, 1595, uh, an old, fairly hoary old lamentable tragedy called Locrine was revived, published in a newly revised version, the revisions attributed to one WS, and it includes some rather fine scenes involving a clown called Strumbo. Um, I uh, don't actually think that W.S. was Shakespeare writing those revisions, but I suspect uh, the publisher thought that by pretending it was, he might get a few sales for Locrine. Well, as I say, it's with the first folio of 1623 that you get this rigorous division into comedies, histories, and tragedies. The notion of a collection of tragedies, we had the Seneca, the Roman ones back in the 1580s. There is a, a, a collection of tragedies purely written to be read, written for the closet by the Scottish aristocrat William Alexander, the Earl of Stirling. The Monarchic Tragedies, published in 1604. Tragedies on classical theme, themes, um, Darius, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar. But Shakespeare, it's Shakespeare's tragedies that are the first packaging of a group of tragedies. It's very striking that, um, not least because Ben Jonson was in many ways much more rigorous about the distinction between comedy and tragedy. But when Ben Jonson published his works in 1616, he arranged them chronologically. He didn't divide them up by genre. In a way, though, 
the actor's division of the plays is strikingly contrary to the reality of Shakespeare's plays because of course Shakespearean tragedy is never pure. Shakespeare's plays are individable. They are tragical, comical, historical, pastoral. I'm going to be talking next week about, particularly about the figure of Hercules um, and I want to demonstrate that Hercules is an equally important figure in two tragic plays, Hamlet and Antony and Cleopatra, and a comic one, Love's Labour's Lost. If you want to come back next week and want to do any homework, Love's Labour's Lost would be the play to reread. Here, though, I want to pursue the pastoral a bit, enough for a moment of tragical, comical, historical. What of pastoral? It's unusual, actually, for plays to be published as called pastorals. Uh, the earliest example I could find was George Peel, The Arraignment of Paris, a pastoral, uh, played before the Queen in the 1580s, full of classical mythology. Pan comes on with a lamb and Faunus with a fawn, Sylvanus the woodman with an acorn. And it tells the story of um, Paris uh, making his choice. Where pastoral really seems to have become significant in the lexicon of dramatic genre in Shakespeare's time was with the publication in Londres in 1591 of Il Pastor Fido, Tragicomedia Pastorale by, the, by Battista Guarini. Very, very popular work in Renaissance Italy and here an Italian text produced and it was reprinted several times in, in, in London. It was translated into English in 1602. It's based on Tasso's Aminta. It's set in Arcadia. A later version was published with an essay on tragic comedy and it really sort of sets the model for pastoral romance as tragic comedy. It had a profound influence on John Fletcher who became Shakespeare's collaborator at the end of his career. Fletcher in 1608 uh, put on a play called The Faithful Shepherdess very influenced by Guarini and it bombed on stage precisely because its mix of tragicomic pastoral didn't please the audience. Fletcher published it with an address to the reader defining tragicomedy um, as being a kind of comedy, but in, uh, 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 as, as being tragic comedy, not because it wants death, which is enough to make it no tragedy, uh, and yet comes near to death, which is enough to make it no comedy, but the point is that it includes representation of familiar people and of gods. The idea you should have gods and heroes in tragedy, ordinary down-to-earth people, all those courtesans and shepherds in comedy, mixing them together, Fletcher says, it didn't please. Well, it, maybe it didn't please, but it got Shakespeare thinking because soon after 1608, Shakespeare starts writing very much in a vein of tragicomic pastoral. His acting company revive an old romance called Musidorus. It's revived in 1610, amplified with new additions as acted before the King's Majesty by His Highness servants usually playing at the Globe, i.e. Shakespeare's company. It is not beyond the bounds of possibility that Shakespeare had some involvement with those additions, in particular with the expansion of the role of the clown, Mouse. Without a doubt, uh, Shakespeare, appears, uh, Shakespeare noticed a stage direction in Musidorus, which reads, Exit Pursued by a Bear. And of course, soon after that, he wrote The Winter's Tale with its own Exit Pursued by a Bear and with its wits and pastorals, the wonderful sequence of Perdita giving out flowers, looking like the classical goddess Flora. She's described as such. Come take your flowers. Methinks I play as I have seen them do in wits and pastorals. Sure, this robe of mine doth change my disposition. The pastoral world of simultaneously wits and pastorals, evocative of vernacular May Day festivities and celebrations, but at the same time, allusions to the classics. O Proserpina, says Perdita in one of her great speeches. Pastoral, though, was primarily thought of as a, a non-literary form. One of the most influential neo-Latin texts of the age uh, was the Adolescentia, the eclogues of old Mantuan, 
in uh, Charles Houle's account of uh, an English schoolroom, he describes how at each lesson, students in the Elizabethan grammar schoolroom would take six lines of a given eclogue of Mantuan, commit them to memory, construe and parse them, write them down, turn them back into Latin, turn them back into Latin, back into English. And who illustrates that process with the first five lines of Mantuan's first eclogue. Mantuan, who tends to moralize the pastoral tradition. The first eclogue begins like this. Shepherds are wont sometimes to talk of their old loves while the cattle chew the cud under the shade, for fear if they should fall asleep, some fox or wolf or such like beast of prey lurking in the thick woods shall fall upon the cattle. And indeed, watching is far more commendable for a prince or magistrate than immoderate or unseasonable sleep. Putting in a moral of that sort very much characterizes Mantuan's way of rewriting the pastoral tradition. Here's Holofernes in Love's Labours. Faute precor gelida quando pecus omne subombra ruminat, and so forth. The opening line of Mantuan's first e eclogue. Ah, good old Mantuan, I may speak of thee as the traveller doth of Venice, Venetia. Old Mantuan, old Mantuan, who understandeth thee not, loves thee not, and so on. Mantuan is, I think, a neglected influence on Shakespeare. In the first eclogue, we find a figure very like Jaconetta, a ruddy and stout face, almost blind in one eye, and yet I marvel at her good looks and compare her to Diana. A winter song that reads, winter snows have come, the north wind is bellowing, and icicles hang from the roof, while Suti Naraya is cooking polenta. That becomes greasy, Joan doth keel the pot. I know Shakespeare doesn't actually do the polenta. <laughs> the gods indifferently above us. Uh, and above all, the image of the folly of love. The deadly plague of love. It's the third eclogue of Mantuan that focuses on de insani amoris exito infelici, the unhappy outcome of mad love. But what is very striking about Mantuan's third eclogue is that the love in question is heterosexual. It's based on the second eclogue. It's a, a free imitation of the second eclogue of Virgil, one of the foundational texts of the pastoral tradition. But of course, the second eclogue of Virgil is explicitly homoerotic. It is about Corydon's love for Alexis. Mantuan, very strikingly, just as he, meant, just as he focuses on um, good moral behaviour, being wakeful rather than idle, avoiding love, even in the second half of his eclogues he, he talks about uh, giving up on love uh, and taking up a religious life. Um, uh, so too, the moralizing Mantuan has nothing to do with the homoerotic. There's one brief, glancing, rather embarrassed reference to Virgil's love for Alexis. The de-eroticizing, and in particular the de-homoeroticizing, together with a vein of misogyny in which women are seen as dangerous distractions from proper male behavior, very much characterizes Mantuan. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why Shakespeare is keen to tease Mantuan by way of Holofernes' fondness for him. After all, Love's Labour's Lost is the opposite of a movement away from desire into a cloistered academe or a monastery. It's precisely with that idea that the play begins and the arrival of the women subverts that idea. For Shakespeare, I want to suggest classical poetry, influenced above all by Ovid, the pastoral tradition, and indeed the whole sense of the pagan world, all those wonderful classical gods we read about in Ovid and other sources. These represent for Shakespeare something that is profoundly anti-Puritan, in many ways anti-Christian, certainly anti-Christian.
pious. They represent, and this is a, a choice, a question I'll be returning to at the beginning of my second lecture, they represent the choice of pleasure over virtue. I'm referring there to the famous choice of Hercules, which I'll begin with next week. The classical tradition for Shakespeare is playful, it is erotic, and it is constantly in motion. I want to end where I began with Venus's hair. I've been thinking about hair in Shakespeare. The wig maker was a very important figure in the Elizabethan theatre. Indeed, Shakespeare, at the key point in the middle of his career, took lodgings with a wig maker. Um, she made wigs for the court, but she may well also have done so for the theatre. And Shakespeare is very interested in hair, just as he is interested in what he calls lively painting. I want to end by suggesting, and this I'm hoping to sort of pull poetry, play acting and painting together. I want to suggest that if Shakespeare does have a distinctive genre, it might be called the genre of lively ekphrasis. Ekphrasis, you remember, is the technical generic term for a poem about a painting. There's a famous ekphrasis in Shakespeare's poem, The Rape of Lucrece, where there's a, a, a description of um, the, the, the siege of Troy. But I want to suggest that ekphrastic moments in motion are one of the key animating elements of Shakespearean drama. A few examples. The Lord in the induction of the taming of a shrew, a very interesting, rather like my point about the two gentlemen of Verona as a testing of Shakespeare's art. Um, the, the, the induction of, of, of a shrew is rather similar to that. And the Lord says this to Christopher Sly, we'll show the Eo, that's Eo from, of its metamorphoses, as she was a maid and how she was beguiled and surprised as lively painted as the deed was done. Or again, Julia in The Two Gentlemen of Verona, uh, remembering acting in one of those wits and pastorals. Madam, twas Ariadne passioning for Theseus' perjury and unjust flight, which I so lively acted with my tears that my poor mistress moved there with all wept bitterly. And of course, famously, Hermione's statue the still statue that comes to life in the winter's tale, prepare to see the life as lively, that word lively again, as lively mocked as ever, still sleep mocked death, behold and say it is well. Hair is always significant in Shakespeare. Cleopatra wants to know the colour of Octavia's hair in order to find out whether she is sexy or not. Golden hair is jokingly sexy and black hair ugly in Comedy of Errors and As You Like It. And of course, famously, Shakespeare parodying the conventions of the love sonnet, if hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head, sonnet 130. Julia, again, in Two Gentlemen of Verona, which I've kept coming back to today, talking about a picture. Here is her picture. Let me see. I think if I had such attire, this face of mine were full as lovely as this of hers, and yet the painter flattered her a little, unless I flatter with myself too much. Her hair is auburn, mine is perfect yellow. If that be all the difference in his love, I'll get me such a coloured periwig. And again a picture, an absolutely exquisite image when Bassanio makes the right choice of, ca of, of casket and gets the picture. Fair Portia's counterfeit. What demigod hath come so near creation? Move these eyes, or whether riding on the balls of mine seem they in motion? Here are severed lips parted with sugar breath, so sweet a bar should sunder sweet, such sweet friends. Here in her hairs the painter plays the spider and hath woven a golden mesh to entrap the hearts of men faster than gnats in cobwebs. Beginning of time and of Athens, we had the, the debate between the poet and the painter. We have a similar debate between Hieronimo and the painter uh, in, in, in Shakespeare's scene for the Spanish tragedy. Shakespeare wants to challenge the painter. And what, what he's doing here, by using his poetry to bring the painting to life and to motion, he's saying, my poetry, my drama, my actors can do what the painter can't, because the painter can't do motion. That's the point of the confrontation of a Spanish tragedy. Art a painter, canst paint me a tear or a wound, a groan or a sigh? Canst paint me such a tree as this? 
the poetic dramatist can embody, enliven a tear, a wound, a groan, a sigh in the way that the painter cannot. Lucrece, her hair like golden threads, played with her breath, the sense that the, the motion of the hair brought alive through the poetic image. Venus Ad Adonis, um, we get something similar with uh, a wonderful account of the, the motion of the horse's tail in the horse passage. But I think to close, uh, uh, the, the, the image that anywhere in Shakespeare is closest to uh, the, uh, the, 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 to Botticelli's um, birth of Venus, to the, so w w I'm imagining a sort of ekphrastic process. I began by taking you from Botticelli to the poetry of Politian. Um, I'm ending by imagining a Shakespearean poetic moment that comes off the page into life, into motion. This is from Venus and Adonis, and I'll, I'll end with it. Bid me discourse, I will enchant thine ear, or like a fairy trip upon the green, or like a nymph with long dishevelled hair, dance on the sands, and yet no footing seen. Love is a spirit all compact of fire, not gross to sink, but light and will aspire. Thank you.